Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Anirudh, and I'm a forward deployed engineer at Palantir. Um, I'm here to talk to you about operationalizing intelligence in an enterprise and how Palantir kind of thinks about that. Uh, just as a quick intro uh, of Palantir itself. Sorry, got two displays here. So as a quick intro, Palantir is a software company founded in 2003. Uh, we're headquartered in Denver, and we're focused on building um, software that operationalizes data, um, sort of decision making um, and uh, you know data driven operations um, platforms. So today uh, we're here to discuss kind of uh, our work in retail, uh, but our work spans kind of 30 plus industries, and we help them generate value through uh, data and technology. So I think one way to summarize today's talk in a nutshell is. Um, is that data architectures, uh, when we think about kind of the end-to-end -end architecture of operationalizing data, uh, they should be designed to harness the complexity of an organization, not necessarily minimize it or summarize it or just ignore it completely. Not sure what's happening there. Maybe some HDMI connection problems back there. I'll just keep moving on. Um, so, you know, if we think about sort of a modern enterprise, um, the 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 way that kind of the status quo of data architectures is set up is all organizations are on a journey today. Uh, they're setting up data work, data warehouses, data data lakes. Um, you know, some sort of kind of analytical capabilities, modeling capabilities um, that ultimately solve a business problem. And I think it's worth kind of unpacking. Uh, you know what. Um, uh, you know what this, uh, what the commonality between um, all of these architectures are. So um, what we tend to see is that while those technologies kind of come together in a very classical uh, architecture, where you have data producers on one hand creating you know data and data products, and then data uh, consumers on the other side, um, you know consuming the products of those data, th those uh, data products through um, you know reports or dashboards. Um, uh, this very much is kind of a linear flow of data or an assembly line of data. Um, and it's very much limited by that kind of producer-consumer paradigm. Um, and while this works for most organizations, it does leave a lot on the table when it comes to, uh, you know, what actions should a analytics person take as a result of presenting the insight that they're creating to the business user and reacting to kind of how the business user reacts to it uh, with the context and the, and the kind of uh, insight that they have. Uh, through being an operator. How does a business user, uh, on the other hand, uh, understand why an insight is being generated and presented to them? Um, and then how do they actually then scenario plan and you know, leverage their own insights um, to you know, kind of plan out the different decisions they can take on that insight? So the key question is how do we generate sort of a feedback loop between the data uh, consumers and the people that have the contextual kind of frontline information and the back office analytics teams who are actually working on creating these insights um, and uh, presenting them to the business. So practically, um, this kind of takes the form of, you know, you might see an insight in a dashboard as an operational user, but because of some, you know, kind of real-time information that you may have on that topic, uh, you might choose to ignore it and kind of move on to the next thing that you have to do without meaningfully engaging in that insight or feeding back uh, the information you have to the analytics person so they can improve future insights. Um, and if we think about kind of what's happening in the world today in terms of kind of exogenous shocks to organizations as well as you know complexities within the four walls of an organization, these um, kind of uh, factors that that influence a frontline operator to make or not make a decision on an insight is only increasing. And what that means is the surface area that an insight needs to cover in order to effectively influence a decision is increasing. Um, so what we need to deal with this scenario uh, is a new kind of architecture where uh, you, know, you have kind of producers in all parts of the organization, not just kind of the beginning of the supply uh, chain of data. Um, so 
what we do or the architecture kind of we follow is one that empowers user in kind of uh, the business side, the analytics side, as well as the data sides to be both producers and consumers of data, uh, albeit different data points. Um, so the data teams can bring their tools there, you know, S3s, Redshift, Snowflake, you know, whatever they're using. The analytical tools teams can bring their models, their uh, modeling environments, um, and work in a kind of a common frame with the business users um, to um, you know, collaborate and actually deliver operational intelligence for the organization. And specifically, um, what this means uh, from an architecture standpoint is um, we need to create a connective tissue uh, between the kind of three different functional silos that I talked about um, to really kind of enable that, that collaboration. So firstly, uh, we need native integration with data lakes, data warehouses, uh, any kind of kind of data store that data teams might be using and allow them to bring that data into this kind of common foundation as the nouns of the business. So things like robots, you know, forecasts, inventory, factories, products, stores, transactions, all of these are kind of nouns in an enterprise uh, as well as the linkages between them, uh, which is fed through the data teams and what they've been working on, but they live as kind of first class uh, objects within a common platform. And we say the same thing to analytics teams, is bring your models, bring your ML models, your LP models, um, or even your Excels, um, and uh, fuse them into the same foundation as kind of the verbs that go with the nouns. Um, and once we kind of start setting up this foundation, I can start you know, setting up kind of ring-fenced, small-scale um, intelligence that says things like, you know, um, what happens if a truck is late or breaks down? How should the business react to that? Uh, what happens when we um, detect a fraud pattern somewhere in the business? And over time, through use cases, you can keep enriching this layer, and you end up with something very powerful that a business user um, can start using in a few different ways. Number one, you can build kind of bi-directional um, uh, applications on this. Uh, which are read write, so a user can, a business user can not just kind of consume the insight that is being generated in this layer, but also feed back uh, the context of what they're seeing in the front lines into the same layer for the data teams and the analytics team to improve their uh, their products. You can conduct more sophisticated uh, analytics, um, such as kind of uh, scenario planning, doing what if scenarios before taking a decision uh, to test out kind of various different um, decision pathways uh, and see the impact, simulate the impact of that on the business before um, actually making that operational change. And most importantly, you can feed the decisions back as a business user into the same foundation without having to go to you know, the different systems of record. So if I you know, uh, find a data point here to change the price of a particular product is sent to me as a recommendation, as soon as I click on accept, um, I shouldn't have to go to three other systems to actually make that change. Um, it should be kind of taken care of by my data teams and my analytics teams, as well as my foundation. Cool. Um, so in the retail context, when we build this layer, um, we actually you know, are able to drive scaled outcomes. Um, and the value chain um, um, in retail is very much sort of connected uh, in a way that, you know, if you're building a pricing use case or if you want to do dynamic pricing, um, you need data every from that spans everything from a supplier to a customer, um, and the kind of having that you know foundational layer of, of data and intelligence and models kind of fused together uh, really helps accelerate these um, op like intelligence operationalization initiatives. So to talk about an impact study here. We have the Fortune 100 retailer um, transform their pricing operations. Um, so before kind of we partnered with them, they operated, uh, they still operate a high number of SKUs in stores, but the way they operated the kind of pricing operations was, you know, um, it was done in a very much assembly line kind of approach. Um, so the operators would query different systems and compile uh, various different Excels based on, you know, different categories or markets and go through rounds of back and forth with merchandisers who are kind of the pricing experts in the organization to finally set prices. And this was obviously kind of a very slow approach um, when you're talking about millions of SKUs. Uh, it is not um, very scalable. They were scaling up by just kind of putting more people on it. 
we helped them move to a more next generation approach here where the data teams would bring um, you know, the sales, product, competition, um, uh, your supplier data uh, into that semantic layer alongside kind of data scientists who had already built powerful um, demand forecasts and kind of pricing models based on those demand forecasts, as well as the business experts um, who um, were directly kind of encoding the rules um, that kind of lived as intuitive uh, things in their heads um, into the foundation um, to actually automate how pricing should be handled across the enterprise with complete transparency and governance in place. And by doing this, they were able to achieve significant impact on the business, uh, we can see here. So I'll jump into a quick demo of how all of this came together, but um, if there are any questions, happy to take them at this point. Cool. So as a note, before we get started, um, the data we're seeing in this demo is notional. Um, this company had you know, millions of products, and they ran a complex pricing strategy, as I mentioned. Um, there were three kind of main functions in setting prices. The first one was the executive strategy, um, which was you know, of being competitive on price, which meant that every time you know, their major competitors changed prices on certain categories, um, they would also change their prices. So they went through this kind of quarterly process of price review. Uh, where they would see competitor data and change their prices based on that for all the um, categories. Um, the second was a demand price, um, uh, demand based pricing kind of approach, uh, which the modeling team and the data science team had been working on, um, and they had built the sophisticated demand forecast model, um, which was being leveraged for it. And then the third one was uh, more kind of ad hoc based uh, pricing decisions that factor in things like you know new contracts or specific seasons. Uh, and so on. And um, you know, there was no way for these three kind of functional silo um, and different users that were actually making these decisions to coexist in one platform. So what would end up happening is you, know, you would end up with kind of conflicting information and conflicting decisions where the data science model is recommending a one price and uh, you know, the, the merchandiser is suggesting another one. Um, and we wanted all of these pricing modes to really coexist in, in that kind of semantic layer of ours. So we first started with bringing the data and the models together. In this data lineage graph that we see here, uh, this is kind of the approach, um, or the graph that feeds our approach here. Um, if I just turn on data flow, um, you know, we, we told the data teams to bring in kind of their, their sales data, their market trends, their campaigns, uh, customers. This is pulling directly from their data lake and data warehouse. It's also uh, pulling from some external APIs as well as um, external kind of data vendors bringing all of that together in this semantic layer down here, which we call the ontology, where you have kind of you know, your objects and links set up. So you have an article, transaction, sales, uh, campaigns, and so on. This data is then used by the um, modeling team to actually build their uh, recommendations, their forecast model. Um, and then the outcome of those models, uh, as well as the recommendation kind of transformations, also live as objects within the same uh, semantic layer, and then are shown to the kind of end user. Um, so now for the non-technical kind of merchandiser, um, you know, they have kind of their own intuition, they have their own um, uh, contextual information that they want to apply on top of this to actually uh, complete the loop. And we tell them to bring their expertise in the same foundation as rules that they can encode in this without actually having to write code. Um, so now imagine, you know, I'm Jesse Benson, who's a pricing manager responsible for groceries in France. I can open up my, um, my rules engine. Um, I've just, um, you know, cut a deal with a vendor to sell their products at at least a 10% margin. So the highest priority for me is to make, you know, or preserve that 10% margin or get more margin on this particular kind of um, product group. Um, and this rule should override kind of all the other rules as well as the modeling outputs. Um, so I go to my, uh, you know, rule overrides. Over here, I can see I have you know three overrides that are active at the moment. Um, this one is very similar, so I can just duplicate this. Okay. Um, in interest of time, I'll just move to a different tab where I have it pre-populated. 
And um, just in a few clicks, I've created a new rule here which says, you know, for orange soda, always keep a 10% margin. And that rule is configured in a few clicks down here where it says, you know, for where the product name is, I'll change this to, um, where product name is that, um, always have a minimum price of cost times 1.1, so 10% over the cost price. And when I'm happy with that, I can submit the changes for my pricing manager or my merchandising manager to review. Um, and this will kind of take, take effect immediately as it's, um, um, as soon as it's, it's approved uh, into the overall kind of enterprise pricing strategy. Once it has been approved, um, I can also kind of add rules here uh, or layers of automation here to say, you know, if the rule that I'm suggesting is over whatever, you know, less than 10% um, uh, of the recommended uh, price that the ML uh, pipeline is generating, uh, automatically kind of approve it. If it's more than 10%, you know, flag it for review for a merchandiser or, or someone in my team to review. And for that workflow, uh, we have another application here that's been, again, built in, in the same foundation. So this is a read-write application that kind of pulls um, uh, data as well as objects from that kind of ontology layer and um, provides a uh, interface for uh, business users to kind of um, not just consume data but also interact with it and feedback information if required. So over here I've kind of filtered down to Jesse Benson who's the pricing manager we were looking at and I can see there are 76 open pricing alerts of which 63 can be automatically resolved. So let's just quickly resolve those. Um, those 63 were the ones that were kind of in the 10% margin window. And now I have 13 price alerts left. So 13 prices are over that 10% threshold uh, of the, uh, the model output, and I need to review them manually. Let's go to um, uh, maybe the orange soda one. And I can see here that the, you know, what the competitive price was, what my current price is, which is 199. Um, the, um, Price from rules is 199, but the, um, the the best demand price, which is the model generated one, is 299. So there's a huge difference there of almost one dollar, exactly one dollar, on a two dollar cost. So now I want to kind of drill into that a bit more and see, you know, maybe if I choose a price that's kind of between two and three, um, I could kind of get best, the best of both worlds. So down here I can see the um, uh, the graph which tells me what the unit impact as well as the margin impact is going to be uh, of all the price points between 171, which is the minimum competitor price, and 275, which is kind of the, the highest price that I can um, realistically um, have. I can also run some scenario analysis before making a decision to actually see, you know, what would be the impact of a, of a scenario of 250. I've already created the scenario, but I can easily kind of create a new scenario here where um, you know I can um, change it to a different price and see the impact of that. On the right hand side, we can see you know uh, what my current sales are, what my um, kind of scenario sales will be, and what my optimal sales will be as uh, recommended by the by the model. And similarly for margins, once I'm happy with kind of the the price that I want to set. Uh, I can go back to my um, alert and simply submit a new price for review. And the new price, I want to make that 250. As soon as I do that, uh, it automatically kind of writes back uh, the new price to the ERP, where you know prices are actually managed the system of record, as well as the the underlying kind of um, ontology or the the data foundation. Um, and the analytics teams can now see. You know, um, this was an exception where my model didn't necessarily produce the right price, um, and I can see kind of you know what were the different scenarios that were planned by this uh, merchandising manager, and um, change the the model accordingly to produce better results in the future. Uh, one more thing I can do here is actually see the model without actually having you know to read the sorry the model code, um, so I can actually go directly into the the modeling objective uh, and 
view the model's performance for the SKU that I was um, I was interested in. So, you know, under the hood, it's a multi-profit forecasting model. Um, I can see that model's performance in, you know, Normandy and uh, the store that I was looking at within Normandy was La Harve. Um, so this model is generally over predicting, as we can see by the purple line here, uh, which gives me more confidence in that 250 price point um, as being the better option. Um, so I think we're almost out of time, but you know, just to recap, we saw how um, you know unlocking collaboration between your business teams, your analytics teams, as well as your data teams um, requires a different type of architecture from the assembly line. And the connective tissue between these kind of functional organizations is critical um, to you know, truly kind of operationalize intelligence and be agile with your data.